2 Timothy 2, <clears throat> we'll start in verse number 1. Paul's writing to Timothy here. He's one of his young preachers that he is um, training, modeling how to be a, a pastor. And Timothy is not being taken seriously by some because he's young, and so he doesn't have that um, seasoned wisdom in the eyes of others. And so Paul's trying to encourage Timothy. And he says in verse number one, Thou therefore, my son, <clears throat> be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou, therefore, endure hardness, that is, hardship, trials, tribulations. He says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth, that is, is engaged in some type of warfare, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So I'll read verse 3 and 4 again. Thou therefore endure hardness or hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, and no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. <clears throat> So, I don't know if you guys know this, there was a holiday recently, um, something about veterans. So they were, we as a country honor veterans, those who have served in the military, um, those who have uh, put their lives on hold, um, put their lives in danger um, for others, for the defense of our nation. Um, and while there are a lot of political things that are tied up in veterans and warfare in the military and people have differing opinions about that, which I won't touch with a 10-foot pole, but I found some, some similarities as I was reading over what Paul is telling Timothy here. And as I read over what the Bible says in general about um, what we call Christian soldiers, people who are soldiers of Christ, so we are called many names, many titles. We are many hats, if you will, as Christians. Um, we are like farmers in that we, we plant seed and we hope for a, a harvest of souls. Uh, we are workers. We are servants. We bring others to the great physician. Um, and one of the things that we're called is a soldier. And the reason for that is because there is currently and has been since I would say Satan's fall from heaven. There has been a spiritual war that has been taking place, been taking place uh, between God and his followers and Satan and his followers. The war that we're currently engaged in is just as real as our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, Desert Storm, uh, World War I and II, Vietnam, any of the wars that may be represented by those in this county or in this city or maybe even in this building the war that we're fighting this morning and that we will continue to fight uh, as long as we have breath is the war for souls. Uh, it's just as real um, as any physical warfare. A lot of times um, this can be uncomfortable in our modern ideologies. So somewhere along the way, um, the smart people decided that education should move away from things like this. It should move away from uh, this type of uh, reality, spiritual realities, and that it should just be imagery or just an illustration or something along those lines. But I assure you that what we're engaged in this morning is, is very, very real. So I'm going to make some comparisons between my experiences in the military and the army and some of the things that maybe when we become Christians that we don't really expect to be part of our lives. Now, everyone has seen a little taste of warfare from Pearl Harbor documentaries to um, action-packed movies. Um, I mean, I think more people died in the first John Wick movie than any war ever, um, all of them combined. 
Um, so, and while I appreciate the attention to detail that the filmmakers have for those sorts of things, um, there are some things that when you're engaged in combat, it's, you don't really, no one really told you about it. Now, obviously the recruiters are unbelievably honest. Uh, they would never lie to you when they try to get you to join the military. Um, they will tell you all the, all the harsh truths that you can expect um, to find out about once you join the military. And so I was all for it. I was like, yeah, look, I'm joining during a time of war to go to war. Let's get it. Let's go. This is, I'm all, you don't have to sell me a song and dance. Let's go. Um, and so it was, I made their job very easy uh, in, that, in that sense. But there, I, I found three main things that I realized once I got, not necessarily just in the military, but when you're a combat soldier or Marine or airman or whatever, and you're actually engaged in literal combat where people are shooting at you and, and blowing you up and really saying hurtful things about you and looking at you in mean ways, which are all you know the sticks and stones uh, categories. But there are three things that I took away after I got back from my tour to Iraq. I spent 12 months there in 2009, so all of 2009, um, January to December. And from that little vacation, there are three things that were unexpected for me when I got there. And obviously we're gonna make some parallels to some spiritual things and then we're gonna talk about um, some of the most important things that, that you're gonna need to pay attention to if you're gonna be actively engaged for Christ. Um, number one, the mission is bigger than you. The mission is more important than you individually. Now that is like nails on a chalkboard to Americans in 2023. I mean, we, everyone's opinion is the most important opinion in the world and must be shared on TikTok and Instagram and, is MySpace still a thing? I feel like I want to get one of those because no one else is using it. I don't have to worry about people <laughs> blowing me up for a follow or an ad or whatever. The older I get, the more I start dwindling down the people on any social media that I might have. So I'm no longer trying to get ads, you know, add-ons and people following me. Normally in the army when someone follows you, it's a bad thing, uh, not necessarily a good thing. But the mission is bigger than you. The collective mission is more important than you as a, a member of the military. Now, this starts to get real and real real when, for instance, you're at a meeting with an important person on our side and an important person who's like an Iraqi village leader, essentially. So we would meet with those guys, and sometimes they're nice and sometimes they're not. But it's how we got to know the land, it's how we would communicate, and we're trying to establish some peacekeeping things, and basically just like, hey, don't blow us up, we'll give you guys some money for a school, and which is generally what had happened. And so we're meeting with them, and I had just got there, I was low ranked, which means you're just a human shield, um, and they said, Alan, get over here. I said, all right, roger that. So I get over there and they say, stand right here. I was like, all right. So I'm standing there thinking, man, I look super cool. We had just gotten there. I was like, everything I have is matching. My boots match. I'm wearing green camouflage in the desert. Not feeling too hot about that. Um, feel like I'm pretty visible, matter of fact. But I'm just standing there and I look behind me and there's a, a, an officer behind me who gets paid twice, well, at that point he got paid about three, much, three times as much as I did um, because he went to college before I did. We've been in the same amount of time, but I went to college after. So he's standing there and I'm like, all right, this is cool. And I was like, hey, Sergeant, uh, what's, you know, what am I doing? What's my mission? He goes, oh, just stand there. And I was like, all right, all right. I was like, is there like a, like what's up? You know, he goes, oh, there's a sniper threat over there. And uh, we want you, but you between the sniper and the captain who's standing right there. And I was like, all right. Uh, I wish you wouldn't have told me that uh, right now, actually, because I'm, I'm not feeling too good about that. But what was my job at the time? Well, first of all, um, if I got shot, that's not good, but it's better than if he got shot for some reason. So I'm just standing there being a human shield for a guy so that he doesn't get shot by a sniper. They're, it's preferable if I get shot. So I was like, all right, that's a little bit of a wake-up call, realizing that the mission what we're trying to do there is more important than me. Now, they gave me a lot of fancy stuff and they're like, we hope you make it out, we really do. But if you don't, the mission's gonna continue and you're gonna get replaced with someone if you go down. 
So we're like, all right, Roger that. I mean, before we left, they took a bunch of pictures of us. And I was like, all right, what is this like a doing like a yearbook thing? Are we gonna sign these at the end of the like the army time? And we're gonna like everyone's gonna pass them around like junior high. And they said no, that they're like, so that's when you die. Um, we're gonna put that on a flag and we're gonna give it to your parents. I was like, all right, I'm don't, I don't think they're interested in it. I think they'd they'd rather me be back, matter of fact. Um, but that's that's fine. And they didn't say if you die, they say when you die. So I wasn't I also wasn't excited about that. So when I die. I get my very own flag. Actually, my mom would probably get it. You selfish son of a gun. You probably wanted me to die so you can get that flag. I can't believe this. A flag, a picture of me, not a flattering one. I'm not very photogenic, um, especially when my hair is like buzzed. I don't have the ears to pull off a bald head. Um, I know that now. So um, some of you do, and some of you look unbelievable. I do not uh, have any room, anything shorter than this. And it looks like a 57 Chevy with the doors open. I, I can't pull it off. So I lost all credibility. But Paul said here in Ephesians, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, for his glory. Now, God's not placing us between important people and snipers. God has a plan for each and every one of us. God is fulfilling that plan for each and every one of us. So there is a distinction. We find in Romans 8, 28, All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that all things work together for good to everyone. If your life and your will is aligned with God's will, it'll work together for the good, which means God's ultimate glory and praise and your flourishing, whether it's in this life or the next one. You have been put in a, in a, in a position where your life can be used for God's glory which is the greatest thing you can do with your life is to glorify God with it. Hebrews 13, verse 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the, Lord, from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work. Why? To do his will. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Christ Jesus. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So why does God perfect you? Why does God work in your life? Why does God preserve you? Why does he bless you and your family? Number one is because he loves you and he wants to bless you. But number two is because it in turn leads to his glory. His glory is the ultimate good. God is more interested in his glory and our prospering and our flourishing than he is our comfort. I had one of my buddies that I currently go to school with um, in, in college was uh, trained with the Navy SEALs. So it's basically like the knockoff version of Army Infantry. So like the Sam's Choice version of the Army Infantry. I'm not saying that because I was Army. I'm just saying, Art, Art can attest. But he trained with the Navy SEALs. And you know that sometimes their training makes their recruits uncomfortable. Did you know that? Sometimes they have to be uncomfortable. Now, they have to run a lot. They have to basically drown multiple times. But they say it's fine. They'll bring you back. And they do most of the time. But some of the training you do makes you uncomfortable. In fact, that's why it's training. It makes you tired, right? And I won't get into the nerdiness behind it, the science behind it, the neuroscience, because I get super excited and giddy about that kind of stuff. But the only one in this county that does, apparently. But when you push yourself to your limits and you get uncomfortable, Neural re-networking hap networking happens in your brain where you create new neural pathways that did not exist before. So uncomfortable positions, uncomfortable times, pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone literally changes the chemistry and the makeup of your brain. So the mission is bigger than you. Number two, you are already dead. That's a really fun thing to, to learn uh, when you get over there. You know, I had a lot of buddies who were like, they had a calendar and they were counting down days. I was like, dude, we got 360 days. Put your calendar, your kitty cat calendar away and your kitty cat hang in their poster and put that in your footlocker, dude. 360 days. I'm not getting like a countdown calendar for this thing, man. That's, it's too long. Wait, like a month out, two weeks maybe. I'm not counting down 300 plus days. 
It's like when you're driving on the road and it's like in 495 miles, keep straight. It's like, holy cow, 400, almost 500 miles and I don't even get the turn, right? When you're on a big road trip, don't count that down. What you do, what most people do, most of the people I've worked with and what I did was, you just consider yourself already dead. That's a hard pill to swallow. You just assume that you are not gonna make it back and you make your peace with that. For some people it's easier than others, but it makes that year go by much better when you're constantly not worried about getting blown up, about getting shot with a sniper, about terrible things happening to you when you're already in a position where your life, as you know it, has already been sacrificed for the greater good. To protect those who will never know what you and others go through and who will never know the sacrifices that are made outside of our bubble. Those who are outside of the bubble that we live in today, that we all appreciate today, those who are outside of the bubble, they don't get the joy of living in the bubble. The, the bubble mindset has been shattered because um, you've, you've lived outside of that. You help to build it and you help to maintain it. It's a different reality that you're living in. I mean, we, the, the Bible is just full of verses about us being dead to our sins. Just a couple, Colossians 3, for you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Galatians 2.20, what does Paul say? I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So he says, the life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God. The old me that I was frustrated and dissatisfied with, that's gone. Paul says, uses the word reckon, which is a great redneck word, but also it means consider. Consider yourself dead in your old life. Consider the ways that you used to, you used to use to try to get, be happy, to try to be successful, to try to get ahead, to try to placate yourself. Your retail therapy, where you buy things when you feel sad. Ice cream therapy, which is one of my favorites, uh, when you feel sad, right? Those sorts of little temporary therapies are not gonna heal what's truly wrong with us. Paul says you gotta crucify that old person that you were. You cannot be a Christian and live in your sin and be happy. You can't do it. You won't do it, it, won't, it doesn't work. C.S. Lewis said that God cannot offer you a peace and a happiness apart from himself because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist outside of Christ. We think it does because we see it on TV and sitcoms and movies and we think that that exists somewhere in the universe, we just haven't found it yet and it doesn't exist. There's a reason why people are attracted to fiction a lot of times because sometimes it shows us things that, that we think are impossible, which are impossible, but it kind of shows them as if they could be a reality. In TV and movies, we see people who are enemies of God and they're happy and they're flourishing and they have peace and joy and that doesn't exist. Temporary happiness, maybe. Being happy for a moment, maybe. Paul says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, so that henceforth we should not serve sin. Paul says, we can't go back to the way that it used to be. And third, combat or war is never as you imagine it. It's never as you imagine it. It becomes romanticized. So there are things in combat that are fun, right? There are some things that are fun, and there are a lot of things that are not fun. And there are a lot of things that would be fun if people weren't trying to shoot at you, which ends up being not fun. Don't buy the lie that the world sells that you can live in, we'll say that the church sells, that you can live for God and that it'll be this really cool, flashy, like super fun comic book type story where, I mean, you're coming out of the house just slanging holy water, um, smoking demons on the reg. I heard that in a song once. Um, I don't really have the street cred to say it, but I'm just quoting it, so it's fine. Uh, but we get this idea that it's going to be this really just elaborate life and I mean we're I mean when we pray it's the 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 earth will shake and the demons will be afraid and 
and um, it's just going to be this really glamorous life and we're never going to have a fight with our spouse or and our kids are just going to be unbelievable. They're never going to break things on purpose like a 65 inch TV right before the college football season starts. No reason. Just saying that. War is, is never as you imagine it. It's romanticized. That's why Paul says, endure that hardship. It's going to be hard. And you ever... Um, you ever see like military, high level military training on TV or something? Or you're watching a football game and you're just like, dude, how can you not run that guy down? And you're sitting on a couch and just like Dorito Cooler Ranch is like all over you and ranch dressings on your face and you're like, you know, shotgunning Pepsis and you're like, just catch the guy. You know, your feet are propped up, you're in your sweatpants, right? When we imagine ourselves in the spiritual life or when we imagine, when we place ourselves in movies where we're the hero, Right, and we're slaying the dragon, or we're, you know, having victory over the over the enemy. We're always happy. We're full of energy. We're well rested. We're warm. We're not cold. We're not hot. We're a moderate temperature. Our feet are comfortable. Our back doesn't hurt. We have excellent vision. There's no ringing in our ears. And so we think, under those conditions, I can thrive. Well, no, duh. Yeah. It's it's perfect conditions. I used to. So I trained with some really high speed people who make me look like a boy scout. And uh, a lot of the times um, they would train for the army ranger school. And so that you'd have to be able to run five minutes in less than 40 minutes and then, or five miles in less than 40 minutes. And then you had to do some push-ups and sit-ups and some other, I don't know, calisthenic type stuff. And so they, when they would, people would train, they would just go train whenever it's the most comfortable for them. But then when they get to ranger school, it's three in the morning, they haven't slept in two days. And they're like, all right, let's go run our five mile in those boots and those pants and that jacket and maybe a helmet just to make it a little bit harder. And you're like, all right, well, these aren't the conditions I trained under. Well, those are the conditions you're gonna find when you get in actual combat. You're gonna be uncomfortable. You're gonna, I, I sat in a hole this deep full of water up to my chest and just sat there for a long time. And it was not peaceful. It was not peaceful at all. There were no fish, right? No music, no cool music. Didn't have my face painted like Rambo. I had chap lips, I was tired, and it was raining, and four people had already been struck by lightning, and I'm sitting in a bowl of water <laughs> with a rifle. Uh, no thanks. When we picture our future, when we picture our spiritual warfare, we fail to account for fatigue, hunger, loneliness, despair, doubt, and fear. When I got the boot camp, I lived 3,000 miles away from my family. I lived in North Carolina. When I joined the army, I saw them maybe once or twice a year. As soon as I got to boot camp, I was unbelievably homesick. I didn't even live with my family. I could live without Joel, but something about being uncomfortable and being really, really cold in the morning and really, really hot during the day and being beat up, uh, well, not beat up by drill sergeants as much, but just being beat up by the, by the weather, being beat up by the activities, rolling around in sand, doing something they call a sugar cookie, which is where you get sweaty and roll around in the sand until it covers you and it's uncomfortable. And then you lay down like that on what a, feels like a Brillo pad of a blanket uh, and a mattress that's, it's, don't call it a mattress, just don't do it. It's embarrassing, it's insulting, the mattress is everywhere. It's not a Tempur-Pedic, I tell you that much. But we fail to account for the hunger, the loneliness, the despair, the doubt, the fear that we all have. We fail to account for just the gut-wrenching conditions we're going to find ourselves in in combat. And sometimes in church, we get excited about spiritual warfare, and I'm not knocking that. I do too. We're like, all right, I can't wait. When I get out of here, things are going to be different. I'm going to start praying. I'm going to start reading my Bible. And then you wake up, and you're cold in the morning, and you forgot to put on socks, and now your feet are freezing, and your Bible's on the other side of the room, and it's dark, and the bed feels unbelievable. feels like the great, most comfortable bed you've ever been in your life. And so we go back to sleep. Why? Because we weren't prepared to start making sacrifices right out of the gate. We wanted to be sitting in front of a, a window with a beautiful view and the coffee's there and it's unbelievable. We have all day to study. And I mean, the kids are quiet or not even in this fantasy, perhaps. <laughs> it's just common for parents. So we picture these ideal conditions and then when we get in spiritual warfare, we never see those ideal conditions. We don't prepare for it. We're not ready for it. My first mission ever, I just got to, 
I just got to Kuwait. It takes you like a month just to get there, get set up, get everything ready. You got to acclimate. It's like 130 degrees. And I'm, I'm, we're walking back from Chow. It's, and there was, we were on this nice base at the time. I say nice because it actually had like a little dining facility. Um, nothing to write home about, but it had edible food. And so we're like, cool. We had, had salad dressing, actual salad dressing. So we're like, wow, that's crazy. Um, I'm about to make myself my own Big Mac. So we're walking back and we're all tough guys because we had just gotten there and we had been through boot camp and we thought we were super cool combat heroes. And then they ran up and they said, all right, hey, we gotta go. I was like, all right, what's up? We gotta pick up, pick a basketball game on that dumpster out there that we cut the bottom out of that we're playing basketball on. They're like, no, uh, two helicopters got shot down and we gotta get out there because they're, they're trying to take all the combo out of it and they're gonna defame the bodies and take the bodies and use them for their own propaganda. And then they're gonna take all this stuff out of there and use it against us. I was like, all right, I, to be honest, I, my food hasn't settled. Um, so if I could have like 45 minutes just to put my feet up, no, we gotta go, we gotta leave. They put me in a truck that I'd never been before, been in before in my life. And they're like, you're driving. I was like, okay, um, hope it's not a stick because I haven't driven one of those in a hot minute. So we're driving out and we're passing guys in pickup trucks with just machine guns mounted on the back. I had just eaten. Um, I don't remember what it was, but it wasn't, actually it wasn't that good. Um, but I'm stuffed, I'm tired, um, I'm not ready to go. It's just like, it felt like I just had Thanksgiving dinner and we're already moving, we're out. We're like two minutes out from the, from the crash site. We can see smoke coming up, we see people trying to come in and just chaos, right? That's, you're gonna have to prepare for the unexpected. So they would always say, just expect the unexpected, which is like, okay, you can't expect the, that's why it's the unexpected, because you can't expect it. But anyway, so the idea is, you, you always picture yourself as energetic, confident, and brave. Make space in your mind that that may not be the case. When you start to implement spiritual discipline in your life, when you start to read the Bible, when you start to practice empathy, when you start to forgive some of those people that you'd rather hang on to that anger just a little bit longer because it feels so stinking good, but you're going to have to start forgiving now and you're going to have to humble yourself and you're going to have to start reading your Bible and praying and it's not going to be amazing when you start. Sometimes it will be. Sometimes God will come down and fill your heart and it'll be unbelievable and sometimes he won't. It's going to be unexpected. Our feelings change when we get in warfare. Prepare. We picture glamour and we're met with mundane spiritual disciplines. So there's a reality based on what we see, right? As Christians who've been saved for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, when you look at your, your life, you, you see things differently than maybe a brand new Christian will. Like you notice different things. Um, you, you realize things about your life that you never, you have a self, more of a self-awareness. And this goes just with age too. Like being around young people, one of the reasons other people's kids, obviously not ours, but other people's kids can be so annoying is because kids are selfish, right? It's just how they're, like they're hardwired to be that way. It's, it's not until probably high school, late high school, maybe early 20s, depending on who they are, that their eyes start to kind of drift out to other people and they start to understand, oh, there's a big world and I'm not the center of it, right? And so we see kids are selfish, not because they're just little weasels, well, sometimes they are, but just that's how their brains are wired up, right? To me, 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 and that's how they survive. If you've been saved a lot longer, you start to branch out and you start to see, oh, okay, it's less about me and my own personal journey and more about the church. It's more about helping other people. It's more about serving and ministering. But one of the things, one of the illustrations I got just, um, I think it was last week, I was watching college football. So that's one way I feel the spirit. Um, it's just by watching college football. I feel like God speaks to me, um, or the commercials do. It's somebody talking, but I'm watching it, and Lottie, she's my eight-year-old, and Lottie is an eight-year-old girl. She's, I mean, everything is fashion, Barbie, dancing, princess, unicorn stuff, and just everything. I mean, it's, it's crazy. So she walks up, and she just starts looking at it. She's like, all right. I can hear her thinking. You can, sometimes you can hear kids thinking or mumbling little things. She says, all right. And every time my kids walk by and I'm watching any kind of sport, first thing they ask, which color are we? Which one are we? Which team are we? Because they're going to like the same team I'm liking, right? And I was like, all right, uh, it's, there's a blue team and a red team. I was like, we're going for the, for the blue team here. She goes, all right, blue team. I, I like that. I like blue. I was like, all right, that's, that's a relief because I was going to have to switch sides. And she's like, all right, um, 
how does it work? I was like, how does what work? She's like, the, what they're doing out there, the football. I was like, college football? She's like, yeah, how does it work? I was like, um, cliff notes. Um, they have to get the ball to the other side of the field, and the, they have 11 people, and the other 11 people are trying to stop them. She goes, all right, I can go with that. All right. So she's watching it, and she's like, um, how come everyone's voting for the red team in the stands? How come everyone's voting for them, and no one's voting for the blue team, our team? I was like, but they're not, okay, they're not voting for them. They're cheering for them. You know, I was like, because they, they're the home team. She goes, all right, what, it, what, what does that mean, the home team? I was like, oh, my gosh. I was like, because they're, and I'm missing crucial place. Uh, I'm like, well, that's because each team has its own little stadium where, close to where it lives, and everyone goes there, and when they play there, all their fans come to play because it's closer. And the other team has to travel farther. She's like, that's not really fair. I was like, well, it's, that's how it is. You know, they just, they're fine with it. They're, they're big kids, so they travel there. She goes, okay. And she looks out in the stand. She says, why is that guy in a banana costume? And is, is that legal? And I was like, okay, well, yes, it's legal. As to why he's in a banana costume, I don't have a lot of time to do a full psych eval on that 21-year-old. Um, but let's just say he, that's how he cheers for his team. She goes, all right, okay. And she would watch, and she'd make little observations that were completely irrelevant to what I was paying attention to. In my mind, I'm thinking, all right, we got to establish the run. All right, they, they're stacking the box on us. All right, they're daring us to throw it because we have a rookie quarterback. we got to establish the run. The offensive linemen have to step up. They have to create space, create holes. If we can get around the outside, we can spread the defense a little thin. Maybe we'll have to respect the pass. But we cannot pass the ball effectively if we cannot establish the run. we got to keep them honest. Right? And I'm thinking that every, all of you are like, yeah, that makes total sense. And so she says, they're working together. I like that. I like it when they work together. And I was like, all right, that's, that's closer. She says, you have to have a lot of energy to play football. It's like, yeah, that's, they're running all the time. So she's noticing a lot of interesting things. And then she saw a guy get tackled and she said, oh, that's really sad. And I was like, well, he played, he's supposed to get tackled. She said, no, the other guy, she had tackle, he had tackled him all by himself. That one guy got left out. He was standing, I was like, well, I think the free safety that took that guy's head off doesn't need help from the cornerback who's half his size, it's fine. And so she's noticing all these different things. And then she says, these guys are kind of famous. And I was like, well, not really, I mean, it's, you know, they're not, it's like Texas A&M, so it's not like it's, you know, not really that famous. She goes, well, you played football, didn't you? And I was like, well, yeah. She goes, so then you're famous, basically. And I was like, yes, yes, I am. I'm, I'm glad that you noticed that. But she notices a lot of different things, very different from my observations. So why does that matter? Because in our spiritual warfare, we have to be paying attention to the right thing. Plus, I just want to tell a cute story about my daughter. It didn't really have that much to do with the message. But... Um, we have to pay attention and we have to pay attention to the right things. If we're getting caught up in little things that don't matter, right? If we're always seeking some sort of emotion and a feeling, we're going to get, we're going to get messed up somewhere along the way. I don't know if some preacher said it, or we got some kind of idea that if we're not feeling like it, then it doesn't count. If we don't feel the emotions of our prayers, then they're wasted. If we're not super excited when we read our Bible, then it's a wasted mission. It's a waste of time that we're just sitting down and reading something that maybe or maybe doesn't make sense to us. We're not really that excited about it, and we're really just doing it out of duty. The seeming monotonous, consistent preparation that we do as Christian soldiers is how we're successful. We want an easy button, and then we want to show up for the big splash plays, as we call them in football. Big splash plays. We want the 80-yard touchdown pass, right? One-handed, you know, whatever. Like, we want to make these big splash plays, and that's so very little of the actual game that's being played. We want to make these really heroic moments where we're jumping out of airplanes on some sort of D-Day assault, and we want to be the, the big heroes, but... That's not the reality of how things usually are. It feels like you're not going to be emotional about it all the time. You're not going to have some sort of great emotional response in your normal, everyday spiritual disciplines. We need to have it ingrained. Why does the Bible say to hide God's word in your heart so that you won't sin against him? Why does he say that? Why is it important to always have scripture in your mind to equip you.
for, for your spiritual battles. Our feelings during spiritual disciplines are irrelevant. Whether we feel like we're spiritual or not is irrelevant. So four takeaways. Number one, remember that God's will is paramount and it is for our good. We don't serve a selfish God who's abusing us and using us just as a stepping stone for his own excitement or enlightenment or joy. We're dealing with the Savior who gave his life as a ransom for our sins. Number two, stop wishing for a life that doesn't exist. Sin cannot make you happy. It's not that it won't. It's that it can't. It's incapable of making you happy. You must crucify that old self, that old you. Number three, don't be lulled to sleep with complacency. A phrase that was drilled into my mind, two phrases, more than anything. Number one, complacency kills. Complacency kills. I would hear that over and over and over and over again. Don't get complacent. Why? Because we may go three weeks with nothing happening in combat. Nothing. Nothing happening. We'll go out, do our missions, talk to people. Everyone's friendly. Everyone's nice. We'll get back. And then one day, when we're lulled to sleep and we're not paying attention and we're complacent and when we're satisfied with where we are, that's when stuff starts to happen and that's when things go down. Complacency kills. Don't be complacent. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Do not get complacent. And the second one was sniper bait. Don't stand still and be bait for be an easy target. Number four, remain faithful and steadfast to the word prioritizing God's will over sin. Now, I could have filled this message with story after story after story of cool things that have happened, right? Fun, explosions, rockets, whatever, um, right? We, plenty of stories for some other time. That's not the purpose of the message, right? The purpose of the message is to remind us that we are engaged in spiritual warfare. Whether or not you choose to participate does not remove you from that warfare. We had people who just didn't even want to pay attention when they were there. They were so burnt out. It had been 9, 10, 11 months. They're tired. They missed their family. They're, they haven't had a real meal in 11 months, right? No TV, nothing. They're just, they're hating life because it stinks and it's hot and you're uncomfortable and your feet hurt. And it's 130 degrees and you're doing four, five, six missions a day and people want to hurt you and it's uncomfortable. But we don't become complacent. Choosing not to read our Bible and choosing not to pray and choosing not to be faithful to God's will does not protect us from warfare and makes us vulnerable because we're already in it. We can't choose to be in it or not be in it. You're going to have hardships whether or not you're a Christian. Right? People who aren't Christians, they, they still have hardships. They still deal with difficulties. They do it alone. They don't have God. And their suffering is wasted. Let me explain that. Everything they go through is wasted. There's no ultimate purpose. For people who don't, say, atheists who don't believe in God, and I'm not going to pick on them, but they believe in nothing. Right? I mean, they can have meaning in this life, but after life, there's nothing. Right? The death is, life is meaningless. There's no meaning to it. But as Christians, why is it important from Romans 8, 28 that all things work together for the good, for our good, for God's good? Because that means everything we go through is an investment into God's kingdom. Yeah. Even if it's your fault, even if you did something stupid, which we all do, and you're paying for some seed that you sowed years ago, it's not wasted. Your suffering is not wasted. Your illnesses are not wasted, right? Your hardships, the death, none of that stuff is wasted in Christ. It's an investment in his kingdom and in our future and for his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Pray that you'll be with us throughout the remainder of the day. Thank you for the patience of your people. Thank you for those who have served and uh, laid down their lives for us. We pray that you'll help us to be mindful of your will this week and help us to serve you faithfully in Jesus' name.
Amen.